All right, welcome back to Beat the Count. We are live here at Sweet Science Boxing Gym in Hawthorne, California. The road to Undisputed has been paved as Vasily Lomachenko has picked up three of the four belts at 135 pounds. I got a couple gentlemen here who are going to help me break that down as well as get to all of your boxing and fitness needs. These are the guys. There we go. So if you guys have questions about boxing or fitness, this is who you want to ask. To my immediate left, I think you're promoted now to uh, <laughs> you know, you're not just like a guest. You're yeah. like a regular, like a, a regular. series regular. Yeah, yeah. There's like an un unofficial set, which is three. three? I think three. This yeah. is my third, yeah. Wow. Of tight and edge strength and conditioning coach, of course, yep. Jerry Arias. Yeah, so first I just want to thank you. Uh, I love this podcast. Um, you bring on different types of guests, which I love tuning in from, you know, fighters to coaches, even photographers. It's one of those podcasts that's very unique as you get different perspectives. And I think uh, I'm all about that, just kind of getting to know some of the behind the scenes. And that's hoping what I'm hoping to give you guys and girls out there listening is a little behind the scenes of what goes on as far as more of the strength and conditioning aspect. Um, that's something that I love talking about. And it's just a, it's a good little eye opener for a lot of fans that don't get to see that stuff. Thank you very much, and you're going to get an opportunity to talk about that because I have a lot of questions nice. actually for you, and I'm Perfect. sure the people out there do as well. And then on the far left, a man who I've run into many times here actually at Sweet Science Gym. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> Train with PJ, fight tips, fight camp, all the fight stuff. We got Coach PJ in the hey, house. It is a pleasure and a blessing to be here on this best day ever. Yeah, this is this is home. So this is as comfortable as I'm ever going to get a place where we not only train and coach, but get to congregate and have a little bit of fun on the weekends, too. So it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I mean, you're originally from Philadelphia, right? I am born and raised in Philadelphia, where I uh, spent most of my days on the playground. <laughs> Chill now, let me stop. <laughs> <How about you>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I made the lovely transition here, moved here about four and a half years ago, and I now call L.A. home. So uh, I am a California boy, weird now, but. Back to my Pennsylvania roots at all times. How did you get from Pennsylvania to Sweet Science Gym? Uh, How did you find Sweet Science Boxing? Man, I, I made a, a lot of different detours left <laughs> and right. Uh, went through West Virginia and then to Jersey and then got all the way to California. Just stepped out on faith and came out here in, in hopes of uh, actually going into UFC gym franchise. And okay. Found myself then uh, stumbling around training some fighters here in L.A. and walked into the doors at Sweet Science and it's been home ever since 2015. Oh, nice. That's awesome, man. Would you call it a bucket list item? Make uh, it out here to L.A.? I, I certainly believe that everyone should experience uh, L.A. at least once in their life. Um, you got to come see this traffic, guys. It's great. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. And Coach Jerry, you recently got to fulfill what I hear is a bucket list item of yours. Yeah, so, you know, growing up, you know, 20, 21 years old, I knew I wanted to, to study exercise science. And kind of our field is like the pinnacle, as far as the organization, is the, is the NSCA, the National Strength and Condition Association. And I remember being 21, 22, one of my, I remember going to these clinics, they have like a national clinic, state clinics. And I remember uh, being in that audience and hoping to be a speaker one day. So this past Saturday, I finally uh, got to achieve that. Uh, the whole topic was about conditioning. Uh, so if anybody wants to watch it, it is on YouTube. Uh, feel free to, to leave some comments. But, yeah, that was, uh, that was an awesome experience. Got nervous. I usually don't. I love public speaking. But this one got me because it's, uh, it's one of those organizations that when you're on stage, the audience is made up of other people who, who are about science. And it's like you can't, you know, you can't just say things that, that are not true. They'll call you out on it. So it's like um, had to do about three months of, uh, of research, and, and it was a great experience. So good. And what was the topic? So it was basically trying to trying to educate people on, on conditioning. So, you know, the word conditioning can mean different things. So I'll kind of throw it to you guys. So, you know, PJ, what do you when, when you hear the word conditioning, what, what comes to mind? Uh, a lot of things. A lot of people can take conditioning all over the place. But yeah. the base assumption is going to be uh, cardiovascular improvements to improve athletic performance overall. That's yep. Base people think, oh, conditioning. That sounded like it came from a textbook, too. So I'm not <laughs> even going to try because mine would have been like running. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but like, you're, not, treadmill. you're not you're not far from <laughs> yeah. the truth. Like yeah, that's yeah. what people assume is just okay, running, yeah. um, you know, high intensity all the time. And one of my goals going into that conference was, you know, I started off the conference as like, all right, you got to be open minded. If you're not mm -hmm. open minded, you're, you've you've you already lost me. 
everything that I say is going gonna, is gonna to go uh, against what you believe in. So my goal was kind of whether it's like personal training clients or athletes, that not everything needs to be high intensity, right? Mm-hmm. It's that mindset of maybe yes. five years ago, everybody was doing hard every day, go hard, go hard, go hard. And because they, you know, there's some research that shows that, yeah, you do get some results. But if you look at the, the literature, like it's a short term thing, you get results mm-hmm. faster, but long term wise, it's almost the same. So it's, it's really identifying what's best for that athlete, for that client. And, you know, we'll go into it as far as kind of some of my boxers that I work with. It's making sure that we individualize their training. You know, instead of having everybody do the same exact thing, you know, we use heart rate monitors. We have a lot of objective uh, measurements and testing like heart rate, resting heart rate and things like that. So I think it's it's educating not just, you know, coaches, but the public that you don't always have to. I mean, PJ, I mean, you train. Is that something maybe you hear a lot that everybody just wants to I'm, I want to push today like every single time, every time it's almost uh I say it, it, it can take a little bit of away from the coaching aspect of it yeah. because everyone wants this cookie cutter type of, yes. I just want to get better. Yeah. Oh, I got to go, let me get stronger. I got to have the best one rep max. And we've seen statistically speaking that science based, you need to have a program geared towards you. Yep. Every athlete is different. Every fighter is different. So yeah. you can't have the same type of program. And yep. Spot on. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> So uh, I was interpreting that as I don't have to run so much, hopefully. But it sounds like that uh, PJ picked up something different. <laughs> no, but I think running is part of it, right? Like, of I, course, I, so of when, course. When I got into training in boxers, I've only been working with boxers for about four years. I wasn't really heavily involved in the sport. I, my belief, my assumption was road work, like eight to ten miles, is unnecessary. Yes. I, that's what my belief was. However, over time, I used to, you know, it's all in context, right? Eight to ten miles, probably not, probably overdoing it, but – a four to five mile run, it's not just the physical aspect. Like if you talk to boxers, they like it because it's more of a mental kind of break. They get to listen to their music. They get to, it's more of a recovery thing. So I used to, you know, go into training athletes like, hey, no road work. We're going to do other things. But they're like, coach, like actually makes me feel good. So mm-hmm. like I had to be, you know, get over my ego and be like, you know what? You're right. There, there's a place and time for it. If you, uh, what we call periodize it, we're trying to plan it and we're leading up to the fight, trying to peak at the right time. So there's a place for everything. I always tell people there's no bad exercise. There's just bad application. Mm, that's so good. You know, something I've had the opportunity to witness, PJ, you with your clients is train mitts. Uh, and I will say that I've, I've seen a lot of people train mitts uh, and, and the people who you're working with. I assume in many cases are there for fitness reasons uh, as opposed to, you know, training to be professional boxers Mm -hmm. in some cases. However, they work those mitts, man. (laughs) So I don't know what your secret is, but they work those mitts. I feel like you made a comment in your thing, which is that even if you are just, uh, you know, if you're going to the general public, it's important to learn some variety of mitt work. Yeah. Is it? Do people just love that? Is that what it is? Like, is it? <laughs> I, people love it. You yeah. see, it, it's very popular, yeah. especially on social media, to yeah. just have a video of you hitting pads really loud, <laughs> slamming, just <laughs> smacking the pads. <laughs> That's what gets the comments. That's what gets the likes. And, yeah. and unfortunately, it, it takes away from the uniqueness of training a athlete and making them learn something, yeah. taking away <laughs> something from your training experience to applying towards life or to get to that ultimate goal. And most times when you just want to hit a nice combination or do a dance choreography, that's basically what it is. You're choreographing you know, yourself to punch, which is not relatively you know, applicable to boxing. That, you don't ever go into a choreographed segment inside yeah. the ring. Yeah. I, I didn't see Lomachenko at all pull yeah. his dance moves out <laughs> like that. Um, so I'm, I'm not a fan of the just generic you know, mitt work. But uh, there is a place for it, I believe, good training should incorporate some multiple aspects of mitt work, not just your fancy stuff. You want to work form. You want to work different combinations. There are some things that you can actually improve your conditioning from doing yeah, mitt work instead of just trying to look pretty on the camera, you know, and uh, that's the social media age we live in nowadays. So. Yep. When you recommend it, coach, uh, for coaches to learn this, if they're, if they're going to be taking on people in the general public, yeah. Is it for that kind of flashy feeling or is it, is it because it's a good exercise or what is it about it that you would recommend? Uh, that, that, that answer is they love it. Like it's fun, <laughs> right? They, yeah. It's, you know, I have clients where 
you know, I have a client that where her goal is, you know, just to look good naked, right? Look good on the beach, right? <laughs> Basically, that's her, her goal. But there's times where she comes in, really, you know, I'm, I'm big on nonverbal language, right? Uh, and to me, it's like I can tell, all right, you just had a, a crappy day at work. She looks at me. She says, I need a box today. It's, it has nothing to do with, uh, with all right, we were on this program. She just needs to take out a little bit of anger. And, you know, they love it. But, you know, we wear heart rate monitors, and it's like, one thing I talked about is there's different forms of conditioning, right? There's conditioning of the heart and then there's conditioning of the actual muscles, right? So to me, it's just a great way to get that upper body conditioning because I've, I've trained some pretty high elite kind of like marathon runners. They got great cardiovascular. You put them on some mid work, they are gassing out because no it's time. a different type of workout, right? Their heart's not the limiting factor. It's the shoulders. They're, they start dropping their hands. They, mm-hmm. And then even like we talked about before going on is the efficiency. If, and that's what PJ hit right on it where it's like if you're not efficient, you're going to gas out. Think of like, the, like we talked about Lomachenko about he doesn't waste punches. That's why he can last 12 rounds. He's not throwing punches and he's missing over time. Mm-hmm. It's going to gas you out. He's very, very uh, meticulous with every punch has a purpose. And it's the same thing with, with conditioning. It's like mitt work allows people to train that upper body. They focus on technique, but even like self-defense, that type of thing. But they just, they love it. It's interesting because you say it's completely different type of workout and you see people gas and PJ, I could see you nodding in agreement. Like, yeah, people, people gas out on that. And I've always said, you know, there's, to me, there's no substitute for the in-ring work. No matter how much you run, Mm -hmm. it doesn't Mm -hmm. prepare you for, for boxing. Uh, And, and there's a lot of reasons that I feel that way. And a lot of it has to do with the nervous tension that will eat and suck up energy when you're in the ring, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're carrying your shoulders too high. You don't know how to breathe properly. It's not quite the same as running and you find that you tire, um, you know, too quickly. Do you think that it, so I I bring that up because last week, I think it was last week, Sergey Kovalev and Anthony Yard. Did you guys see Mm -hmm. that? That I saw it. Yeah. Anthony Yard, who ultimately was dropped in the end of the fight with a jab. He was hit with a jab and was, and was, and was stopped. And they had been vocal prior to that fight saying we don't we didn't spar we didn't do any sparring in mm. preparation for this fight and i could see the way that you react to that so uh, can you verbalize that emotion that you were just showing on it's, your face <laughs> it's a discredit to a fighter going into a elite performance and not getting the reps in yeah. not going through the practice there's a reason why football teams do scrimmages there's a reason why i was just gonna before, say yep. uh, a huge performance on stage or on a concert Artists rehearse and rehearse again and rehearse again until it's like a performance because you need to go through the emotions. Your your body's going to change differently. Again, there's going to be factors that come in like adrenaline. There's going to be injuries, things to come up on that last minute. And if you don't put yourself in in the worst possible predicament, if you don't prepare for the worst and expect the best, you're going to be out of luck. And that's exactly what we saw. Because the first couple of rounds, and I was watching that fight, I was, like, I was like, oh, Kovalov looks great, but I think Yard's going to beat him. Mm. <laughs> this is, yeah, you got to prepare your body, prepare your mind to go to war. And, yeah. and uh, before uh, we move on, is you were talking about you played football in college, right? It's one of those things where you talk about why do a lot of injuries, like people that hold out, mm. right, in the middle, of the, in, in, early in the season, they're in great shape, but they're not in football shape, not right? You got, pull, you got hamstrings that are getting pulled, growings, ACLs. It's because you're holding out, but you're not playing the actual game. You're not. There's no uh, specificity where, like you talked about, it's like there's being in shape, there's basketball shape, football shape, boxing shape. You got to go through that preparation, and, and specificity is the king. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. So we talk about basketball shape, football shape, boxing shape. PJ, you were uh, an athlete as a football player at West Virginia, yeah. and obviously you're an athlete who has a lot of experience in boxing. How different are those two experiences, and is there any any crossover, anything that you found was useful coming from a football background? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of crossover between not just those sports, but majority of sports. A lot of sports yeah. where you're moving, you have to use your hips, your hand-eye coordination comes yep. into play. Um, I was very fortunate to... Uh, basically be almost transitioning out of playing football at the, at the highest level, Division One in the Big 12, to then be competing in the amateurs at 185 pounds in boxing. And I had still relatively remembered a lot of what I was doing in practice. My body was conditioned to go all out, yep. running into another human being full out uh, in order to inflict They frown damage. on that in boxing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do. You're not supposed to tackle. Uh, you know, actually, Campbell Luke almost Campbell tackled actually, yesterday. Yeah, yeah, he he leg swept him. That should have been a point, should have been a point deduction. <laughs> He must have played football back in the day or something. (laughs) But I say that there is a lot of crossover. uh, But 
you cannot specifically just they don't yeah. translate immediately you can't just say oh he was great at football or he's good at wrestling he's going to be good at boxing you have to put the work in you have to train your brain to go through these specific motions and movements and that people uh they say uh that you need to get the uh rhythms you need to have mm -hmm. uh, the patterns down so i love taking athletes from football because there's a, a mindset a toughness that does come from football generally um, and footwork is one of the biggest things that can translate across it's still a little different um, but I do love multi-sport athletes I think that, that is one of the sweet spots I find in training people is that if you have some sort of uh, background whether oh, that yeah, is boxing what, uh, whether that is football or wrestling or even something like judo you can translate really good into combat sports. And here's the difference between like, you know, here in, uh, in, the, in America, we specify, we, we are so, mm. so specific with our sports, right? If like yeah. people that have kids, they play baseball all year. They play basketball all year. You got tournaments versus in Europe. It's like, no, they do gymnastics as kids. Mm. They do, you know, they're doing a multiple sport, Olympic weightlifting, right? And in Asia, they do Olympic weightlifting as kids. And it's like, there's a big difference between at some point athleticism, you know, it's, like, like how you said, it's like when I have an athletic like client, it's so much easier to teach them how to squat, how to lunge, how to hip hinge versus someone that hadn't, hadn't played sports. They don't know how to move their body in space, right? They need a lot more coaching, a lot more cueing versus it's like, no, we've done this. I play basketball. I know how to get in an athletic position, volleyball versus someone that's like, wait, what athletic position? Like, what does that even mean, right? Mm. Speaking of multi-sport athletes, Michael Dutchover checking in on the chat. Oh, What's big up, Dutch. Mike? Michael Dutchover, make sure to catch him on Showbox. Hey, main the event. The new generation. Yeah, the main event yeah. on Showbox, the new generation, September 20th. Yep. Of course, trained by Jerry Arias. Strength and conditioning, not Strength boxing. Yes, not boxing. <laughs> People always yeah. tell me, I'm like, no, I don't I apologize. Boxing, right? <laughs> I apologize to Coach, da Coach Danny, Danny Zamora. Will probably get, get Coach upset. Danny Zamora, who is the, the chief second for Michael <laughs> Dutch over. Strength and conditioning, of course. Uh, but Jerry I told, Arias, I told Danny that whenever life. he needs a break, I, I can take over for maybe one or two fights. Yeah. Uh, and a shout out also to Lily from Chicano uh, Boxing. Thanks for jumping on. I appreciate hey. you guys. Oh, I, I made a sound effect out of Michael. Here we go. Bang, bang. <laughs> that one right there. That's that's, that's awesome. his bang bang. You got it right. <laughs> bang 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 bang. Uh, I did a I did a, a a promo for Combat Sports Collective like two episodes, and at the end of it, Michael Michael did this. Bang bang. <laughs> so I I made a sound effect out of it. Can you ask him what's his uh, what's his fight name? Because this guy has about six different names. He, you need the a West Texas he, Warrior. No, but oh, he, he has Dutch. One. He has uh, Dutch. He has like five or six different names. I'm like, dude, you got to pick one because like at some West point Texas you got to stay. You gotta stay, uh, think, stay with it. You know, I, I think what matters is how they announce him. Yeah, that's you know. True. So if they announce true him true. as that's the West true. Texas Warrior, that's what he is. <laughs> He's the West Texas Warrior. <laughs> nice. But yeah, shout out Michael. Thanks for jumping on. I appreciate it. That's my guy. Something I think, uh, as as I was watching your presentation, yeah, uh, you you made a, a few mentions of boxing throughout the presentation. I took down a couple notes of things that I wanted to ask you about. Okay. Uh, and one of those was uh, you were talking about. The textbooks don't always translate to work in the field, and that may have to do with the equipment that you have or it, many different factors contributing to it. Uh, and one of the things you said is, in my case, from a boxing perspective, maybe that culture is different. Yeah. I think I know what you mean by that. Culture yeah. is different. But can you describe for me sort of what you mean by boxing yeah. culture is different? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, you look at MMA. Like, you, you look at most... MMA athletes are probably going to have a strength and conditioning coach on their team, right? It's just they, they've accepted it that, hey, you know, there's science to it. There's a way to make the athlete perform better, recover better. And I think boxing is still still behind. They're True. still kind of evolving into uh, they still have the mentality that lifting weights makes you slow. Lifting weights all automatically is going to you know, blow you up into a bodybuilder. Um, that there's not a no way that you can specifically train a boxing athlete that's not going to make them gain weight, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's one of those things where it's, it's, it's slowly changing. Like I can see it evolving where the, the bigger names have a strength and conditioning coach, um, but I think it's still behind. I see, I see some videos where it's like, and again, it's hard to tell in a video. I'm never quick to judge because you don't have context, right? You don't know yeah. what, what's going on in the program, but there's some things where it's like, you know, like weight cutting, right? Weight cutting's a perfect example. It's like there's things, athletes that just don't eat. And it's like you could – 
actually still cut weight while you're eating. There's just a process behind it. But even lifting weights, you know, if you're out of camp, like mm-hmm. you can lift weights, right? Because to me, it's like I use lifting weights as more of an injury prevention, right? right? It's like you got to be strong, not just the muscle, but the ligaments, the tendons. So it's like if you can understand that it's not usually what people think strength and conditioning but i get it because you know in the past there's probably been some some injuries there's probably been yeah. some so, so it's like some boxing coaches might be a little hesitant yeah, to, to bring someone on board but um but the, i think it's it's slowly evolving but it's still got a long way to go mm-hmm. it's funny because one of the things that you talk about in your presentation is confirmation bias yeah and i agree boxing is is an old school sport it's it's a lot i think in many many cases you can see examples of people who the knowledge was just passed down generation yeah. through generation. Yeah. And tradition. what gets, yeah, it's tradition. It's and what, and what gets lost is the why, why, why do I perform this particular exercise? Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of times you may ask someone this because that's how they were taught. Yep. Right. That's how they were taught to do it coming up in whatever gym they came up in. Um, and, and I think I see kind of a lot of that in boxing, but you talked about confirmation bias and what will happen or what I think is amusing is like you see an, an incident like Andy Ruiz who then wins out over Anthony Joshua and people will point and go, see, this is boxing, yeah. not bodybuilding. Yeah. That's why you shouldn't lift weights. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they will use that as yeah. ammo for saying this is why yep. we focus on boxing, not on building muscle. Yeah. Right? No, I, and I've seen you. Know, you hear that. You hear people talking about Joshua's too big, too muscular, but – it's like you don't give him credit for all the other fights that he won. You know, like he didn't completely ch- – I, mean, I don't know his strength coach, but I know of him. He's a great strength coach. Um, he's He's got his degree. He knows what he's doing. It's just – but, yeah, it's quick to point the finger when they lose, right, because confirmation by it's like, see, that's exactly why he lost, but it's like, no, he got outboxed, right? Right. <laughs> And that's where the tradition continues to go on. We start seeing this taboo. Oh, yes. he is a strength yeah. conditioning coach. He doesn't see better, it, better it, record. It doesn't, it doesn't yeah. work. I appreciate you noting that a lot because it is starting to evolve slowly. Yeah. You're seeing some of the bigger names actually employ a strength yes. conditioning coach. And it's something that I've been I've been talking about this for like a decade, man. Yeah. It's unbelievable that the MMA world has just I know for a fact, in, in order for me to be the best fighter, I need a nutritionist. Yes. I need massage a therapist. massage therapist. I need a strength conditioning need a psychological coach. I need a sports psychologist. Yeah. You know, and that's something that boxers are like, no, I just, my coach says yeah. I should do my road work. I'm going to listen to tr- what tradition says yeah. and what his grand, great, 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 great grandfather, who was a mm-hmm. boxing mentor to somebody who was in the gym Spot when Muhammad on. Ali was taking a bat, like the, things like that uh, go yeah. on and, and it's unfortunate, but. I am, am I uh, people like you and me are going to sit there and we're going to train athletes and continue to spread knowledge yep. and make people aware. I think people perish for a lack of knowledge and yeah. it's people like us getting out and telling people on the internet, telling fighters and athletes, giving you good knowledge that you can build strength. You can become faster, yes. a better fighter. Yep. You can become more agile, get better balance. You become way better or closer to the fighter that you want to be like Vasily Lomachenko or Floyd Mayweather incorporating strength and conditioning into your training regimen and yep. it has to we have to continue to keep teaching this to people and generations because again it's a generational thing i feel like yes. a lot yeah. of the fighters today look at like well let's look at the model let's do what floyd does yep. and then copy that and now everybody wants to do the shoulder roll and everybody wants to make 30 million dollars a fight not yep. realizing that yep it's a little it's a little far-fetched here okay yeah 100 percent that tradition I think it's a combination of tradition, but also in boxing in particular, a number of the things that you're referring to, I think, are looked at as like uh, luxuries or commodities, Mm -hmm. right? So you look at it and you say, hey, the average fighter perhaps can't afford the strength and conditioning coach, the nutritionist, the uh, recovery specialist, and all of these extra things. All they really have is their boxing coach who taught them everything that they know, Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that's it. And that may be the case, but I also think that as you elevate and this and you decide to dedicate yourself to this craft and become a professional and get mm-hmm. you know a few levels above it you have to start to evaluate things like that when you experience success if you're going to take it seriously right. and i think and that's not to say that everybody at any level should can afford all those things but certainly you know if you're looking to take the next step in your career as a professional 
you have to look at it and go, mm -hmm. yeah, what's the what's the best way to incorporate this? Then they, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, Please, go ahead. Uh, it, then it's, it's an investment, right? Yes. Like you said, yeah. in the beginning, I get it. It's like you probably can't afford. But there's always ways to, you know, go to a coach, and there's ways to – work something out. I mean, for me, it's like, I'll, 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 there's times where like, I'll train someone for free. Right. It's like, because I'm sure you want to say that on a no, live, no, but, no, but, no. but, <laughs> it, it, no, but you got to look at it more, more from like, it's an investment That's because true. I have like a growth mindset where it's like, I genuinely want to learn how to train athletes better. So it's like, Hey, let me train you. And maybe down the road. Yeah. We can talk a little bit of finances and things like that. So I think it, it's like, you don't know if you don't ask, I know other coaches that train people for free. Like I, I do. And, and it's like, Again, confirmation bias. It's like, no, they're too expensive. Have you asked? No, you haven't even asked. <laughs> like, true. there's always ways, you know, if someone owns a gym like myself, it's like, hey, you promote the gym. Like, there's always ways around. It doesn't always have to be money, right? It doesn't always have to be money. So it's like, just what's the harm in asking someone? And, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's an investment. But the thing is, like, once you start getting bigger fights, if you don't invest in, mm -hmm. in a strength, that's when it's like you're, you're missing the, the, the boat. Yeah, I actually think you'll see that with boxing trainers a lot as well, meaning a trainer may be competent enough to take you to a certain level. Yeah. Uh, and then beyond that, you may have to examine. This happens a lot, I think, in boxing when you see people who are trained by their parents. And, and I may yeah. take some criticism for that because there are always exceptions to the rule. There are people yes. like Papachenko who obviously nobody could have accomplished what he accomplished. I mean, he's on, on his way to have, having trained two undisputed champions in a very short period yeah. of time, right? Uh, so obviously that's that would be an exception to the rule. But a lot of times you get a fighter. Uh, he does well as an amateur. He's a professional. Mm -hmm. He's been trained by, you know, his his mother or father. And he gets to a point where it's like, oh, maybe you need mm -hmm. to add Different some level. more things. Right. right? Yeah. A lot of people will go into that mindset. If, if it's not broke, don't fix it. I've been winning. Yeah. We've yeah, been getting yeah. some success or some fame or some notoriety. Yeah. Uh, why, why change some things up and, and risk it? And unfortunately, I feel like too many people don't want to risk, don't want to step out on a chance yeah. and, and make the necessary investments yep. to secure their future. And it's unfortunate, but we're seeing more and more of the top, top, top guys. I think uh, like maybe five, six years ago uh, when 24-7 was really big. I used to love yeah, watching. I love that show. Oh, man. <laughs> Pacquiao and Floyd and then yeah. Marquez, uh, even they would start showing these strength conditioning segments. And we're like, oh, this is new. Yep. I feel like that opened a lot of eyes in the boxing community. But for, you know, educators and people that have been involved in working with athletes, like, this is a no-brainer. In a, in a combat sport where you're going all out effort, sprinting at a high maximum value, mm -hmm. above 90% of your heart rate for 36 minutes, you need to have some sort of recovery throughout the week. Yep. You need to have some sort of ways to get stronger, to make sure that you can recover and make the most out of that performance. And uh, I, I don't see anything else except investing in a strength and conditioning coach or somebody that can at least help you. Uh, grow i will say that marquez was doing some wild stuff yeah, in the <laughs> that was just, i, I won't even that. talk about the specific training <laughs> regimens that juan manuel marquez <laughs> followed but i'm gonna go out on a limb and say that they're not things that are recommended by you gentlemen necessarily <laughs> no, no don't play that game but even even injury prevention i think that that comes along with it's like even if you have someone that's maybe maybe and that's how i my mindset going into working with boxing athletes is I got to earn the trust of their boxing coach. And that's what happened with, with Danny. Danny, I, I've known him my entire life. And I remember when I got my, my master's degree, he still wouldn't let me touch any of his athletes, right? He's like, no, like, no. So he, what he did, he gave me some of his, his, you know, his younger fighters. And like, I didn't do, so like talking about what's practical, I didn't do much with them. I just did some really basic exercises, more uh, core work, injury prevention, because I needed to get Danny to buy in. I needed to him. I needed the athletes to go and be like, coach, I feel better. Right. I'm not, I'm not as sluggish. Now, Danny's like, wait a minute, everything that I thought was going to go, was going to happen. is not happening. And then slowly he started giving me more, more, more leash. Right. And then eventually it's like, man, my guys are feeling better. And now it's like, and, and we always talked about it on the other podcast is about communication, right? It's like, coach, how many rounds do they spar today? Cool. We're going to switch up our workouts because they've already did their high intensity type of workouts. Then we're going to do a little bit more core work, maybe some, uh, some injury prevention, that type of thing. So communication, cause there's, there's times where the strength coach is completely on their own. The boxing coach is on their own. There's no communication. And that's where it becomes a problem because it's like, you don't know what maybe the, the coach wants the athlete to work on. You're doing something totally different. It's like you got to got to communicate. Really important. I think that one thing that you showed that was a really powerful visual, actually, 
it was someone ho- like lifting the barbell as if they were doing a bench press. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And your point being made is that we, everyone just looking at this photograph can tell the level of intensity that this particular athlete is going through because we can see how much weight is on yep. the bar. Yep. But when we look at a picture of a runner, for instance, or someone who's just gone on a, on a run, you can't see that. You can't see that level of intensity. We don't know where they peaked at. Yep. PJ, you spoke earlier about individualization, right. about each sort of athlete needing to have their own sort of tailored performance. And I think these two things are kind of going hand in hand because, Jerry, like uh, one of the points you were making is, uh, you know, on a baseball team or a team of people who are running, what's high intensity for one person may not be high intensity for another. Right. So how do you guys make those adjustments or what sort of evaluation do you have to go through to determine, Okay, what am I going to what do I need to put this individual through? What type of work should be we working on for for this person? Yeah. Uh, so for me, it's I think it's like doing some. And again, I think people because I love technology. I love objective measurements. I don't like to tell an athlete like you're getting better. It's like, no, I, show me some numbers. Show me some analytics. So it's like a basic, basic thing that every athlete should have is a heart rate monitor. Mm-hmm. Just get yourself a heart rate monitor. They're seventy dollars. One of the best investments. But then don't just get it and not know how to use it. You know, you got to learn how to how to train in different uh, in different zones. So. That would be my first thing, but I, you know, basic tests like checking your resting heart rate. When you wake up, check your resting heart rate. Like Mike, he's like in the low 40s, which is That's insane. Good. That's, That's really good. Someone like a like a Dustin Poirier from from UFC, he, they just posted like a video, and he was like in the 35s. That's, That's a incredible. great measurement of your cardiovascular health. So it's like, are you testing? I'm scared some? to try that now. <laughs> <laughs> So resting heart rate, get yourself a heart rate monitor and, uh, and know, okay, so if you did, if you went eight to 10 rounds and they were, you know, sometimes the guys wear the heart rate monitors inside the ring during sparring, sometimes, sometimes not. And, you know, I've, it, it highly depends on the sparring partner. If they're in there with someone, you know, at a high level, they're going to be in the higher zones versus someone not so high as far as their level, they might be working more on technique. So they're not pushing themselves as much. So it's like if you're sparring and it's a killer session, you're going to come with me and we're going to do something more of a recovery workout versus if you're working on technique and the, and the sparring and, and, and your boxing workout, we're going to work more on the higher intensity zone. So I think it's being able to distinguish, but like how you said about the bench press, it's like, if you can't measure, you're guessing. If you can't test, you're guessing. I love that. That's yeah. real. You got to do it science-based, man. Yeah. I think, uh, PJ, one of the things that you mentioned earlier, you were talking about all of the different types of, you know, strength and conditioning coach, nutritionist. And one of the things you said was a sports psychologist, you right. know, get, get your mind right. And there's this attitude that you project in all of your Instagram posts, all of your YouTube stuff. It's just, I, I don't know how to describe it other right. than extremely positive energy. Right. Right. Extremely positive energy. And it says, for instance, on your shirt oh. printed, believe in yourself. And you have uh, a mantra, yeah. if you will, that you repeat on all your posts. Would you share a little bit about your philosophy um, and what that mantra I is? I would love to. Uh, I, I speak it. I, I live it. Uh, I would hope that every day that I get a chance to live, um, not just my words, but my actions would describe this. And uh, what you're getting at is the best day ever. Uh, BDE um, is something that I've been going by for you know, 12 years, I feel like. Uh, and it's just it's a mindset that every day that we have a chance to be alive is an opportunity for you to maximize every movement and moment you have. Um, I was just getting into the part about you know, technology. Uh, I partner with a, a company called Aura Ring and I can actually track my sleep. Wow. So I see, you know, and this is great, I recommend all my athletes to know what their resting heart rate is throughout, nice. throughout the night, what the recovery is, how they're being able to function the next day. But again, going to that, you see on sleep how low our heart rate gets mm-hmm. when we're asleep. We're literally almost as close to dead. Uh, so when we wake up the next day, it, it is a gift. It's a blessing for us. And I, I fully believe by faith that we should just use every moment to maximize our potential, to make this world better. And there's really no reason, no excuse why we can't. You know, everybody is going to give, have different circumstances. We all have different life backgrounds and circumstances that we go through. But how we respond is completely up to us. We can all go through some of the same things, but respond differently. And the biggest thing for me is to take hold of your thoughts, to take captive of your life and to realize and know that not your past, not your family, not your coworkers, not your coaches are responsible for your life. So in order for you to get better, you got to do it. 
in order for you to maximize your moments, you have to get up and put the work in. And I don't think that we should ever live life with an excuse or a regret because they're just wastes of time. So uh, I like to live that every single day. I, I speak that, I live that, I preach that to my clients, to my students, to my family members and those in my community. Um, and it's something that I just want to carry out anywhere I go. Yeah. And, you know, something that and I think anybody in the world can be given that little bit of hope to make the most out of your day today. Can't change yesterday. Tomorrow's not here yet. So work with what we got today. That's I have Beautiful, an attitude man. of gratitude. That's it, baby. Yeah. Come on. 86,400 moments each day to get better. Why would you not make the necessary step to go forward? So. Yep. I'm feeling impassioned and inspired already. Actually. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like I'm like I'm I'm ear to ear. For those of you who are listening to the uh, just the audio version of this, that's that's awesome. <laughs> there you go. I feel like I need to get up and do a workout right now. We can do some burpees. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Maybe you can. <laughs> hey, Coach, let's talk about, uh, for a minute, Jerry. You have a concept that you like to follow, which is level up. Hashtag level up, yeah, right? Yeah, I love that. And you recently put on Instagram kind of what a brief description is to you in terms of what, what does level up mean? So to me, it's, it's one is kind of what, what, what you talked about, about controlling what you can control, right? It's like there's so many things in our life that we don't have control of. I don't have control of who my parents were. I don't have, but there's so many things I have control of. So it's like, you know, I'm a big book guy. I love I know, reading books. Yeah. I, I read books all the time. And it's all about personal development, but it's, it's helped me shape my mindset. So level up is like, you, like the people you spend time with, who are you around is going to shape who you're at, who, who you are, right? It has a mag so huge impact on what you eat. Mm. You know, do you, are you into your health, your body, your mind, your spirit, who you surround yourself with, the books you read, the conversations you have on a daily basis. Like to me, like perfect example. And again, it's like, I stopped playing fantasy football this year. I've done it for 13 years, but it's like, to me, it's <laughs> like, no, I, 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 it was, it wasn't, but it was, to me, it was just like, I, I needed to shift my focus away from other things, right? There were certain things that I had to cut out of my life. They weren't giving me any value, right? Now, you know, some people, they use that as an outlet to maybe de-stress it. So it's not me judging anyone. But for me personally, I rather, you know, I go to museums and read some more books, hang out with like, I'm, I want to hang out with this guy. Like this guy, <laughs> I can already tell I'm vibing with this, with him. But it's, it's, it's your mindset and always making sure you're not getting complacent. Mm -hmm. Like there's always levels, Right. It's like we even when you think you made it like my I just came back from my best friend's birthday last night and he got a beautiful house and he's like, I'm set. I'm like, no, you're not like there's more to, to life than just you know a nice house. Like you got to level up. What, what's next? What's you know, be a better father, be a better husband. Um, so it's always about continuing to get away from the mindset of being complacent, having a growth mindset and your ability to learn from people, be around other positive, like minded individuals. Um, and when it comes to boxing, it's like they always say that there's levels to this, right? It's like there's levels know, to this. Yeah. So come yeah. on, I'm giving you guys one of these here. Bang bang, <laughs> there you go. well deserved. <laughs> well, that was well deserved. You guys, bang, that was bang. awesome. Yep. Shout out to Anthony Garcia who jumped on. Iconic Said boxing. You guys are always hey. always dropping knowledge. They are, man. That's why I get these guys on here. They always, they, you know, I learned something. I learned something. I'm learning something right now, man. This is <laughs> incredible. <laughs> PJ, so we talked a little bit about the transition from football to boxing. Uh, we talked about it from a practical standpoint, which is how do those skills translate? Yeah. How did you come to find boxing? So where did you – I know you said you went from being a college football player mm -hmm. to an amateur boxer at 185 pounds. Right. Um, what, what was your thought process or what was the decision-making behind going from college football to right. then boxing at the time? Well – Honestly, uh, at the time when I got involved in the boxing uh, a little over a decade ago, um, I had just come from uh, playing football and actually, you know, a little uh, deep in about it, I had actually been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. So going through a, a season of my life with a crazy car accident and school and football being taken away from me, I had suffered a mental illness or a mental health problem. And it was a tough season in my life where I was not taking care of myself physically I was not doing the right things and I wasn't around the right people and um, you know actually I don't think I was exercising for like four months actually uh, put on a ton of weight and you know by divine chance I ran into a flyer one day that said WVU boxing and I didn't even know West Virginia University had a boxing program mm -hmm. and I was like I'm not doing anything on a Tuesday afternoon let's just show up and I showed up and it was a little intense it was a very 
small room and uh, as you figure boxing is not the most popular sport but it was very packed in there and there was a lot of athletes just working holding actually the first time i was introduced to boxing they were holding mitts and doing drills and i was like i like this <laughs> i could i could vibe with this and i got in worked out with the team coach loved me i somehow f fell into this southpaw stance even though i'm right-handed by nature and uh, it started to just, the ball started to roll. Um, I took a, a, a leap of faith, I think, just stepping out into boxing because I didn't know if I was good at it. I didn't know what it required. I just knew that it would take a, a mental toughness to come out of where I was to get to where I wanted to go, which was to be, be better, to be an active member of society, to be social again. Um, and when I got involved, it, it was like a bug. I started to just get acclimated. I was like, this is a fun, fun thing we're doing here getting hit and not getting hit, making someone miss moving, uh, seeing the levels to it, the not, not playing uh, checkers, but playing chess started to be a part of the training. And I, I just became in love and thrown with it. I was very uh, fortunate enough to have a, uh, a coach who actually is from Southern California, Sam Checa, coach me at West Virginia and take me under his wing and um, hold mitts with me, teach me, under, lead me in a way, help me spar. Um, and I just had a really good coach, which I think is a, uh, narrative that a lot of people in the boxing community have. They had a really good coach that became like a father figure to them who um, helped me, cared for me, you know, even though I wasn't his blood. And that was the, 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 ch the chance that it took. And, you know, I'm glad I took that chance because uh, ironically, you know, I got involved in boxing later. You know, I was, I was 20 years old when I started actually, or 19. And because of that step into, you know, working at West Virginia, I then became an amateur and won my first couple of fights by knockout and then later became an all-american and nice. then transferred and used those skills and applying my knowledge and my degree in sport exercise psychology into now training athletes and getting certified in personal training and strength conditioning and i took that to ufc and started getting involved with some big high-end athletes and then made my transition from the east coast here to the best coast mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> so one of the quotes that I grabbed uh, that I wanted to ask you about was this one, which was one of the great things that boxing teaches us is to become resilient and apply that to every area of your life. So I grabbed that from one of the YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned that you were kind of in a bad season when you found right. boxing. Right. Do you feel as though finding boxing allowed you to strengthen other areas of your life at that time? I would totally say that. Uh, boxing, it, 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 it's more than just, you know, being in the ring it's more than putting the gloves on and getting a little sweat if you go into boxing with that mindset i'm just going to sweat you're, you're wasting your time it is a a mental uh not a game it's something that you don't play so in order for you to check into that reality you have to go okay i'm going into a place where i may hurt someone i may get hurt i'm going to be pushed out of my comfort zone it's not going to be easy do you still want to do this and the answer is yes you're going forward into a really tough situation even though yeah. now we know that the boxing community is very small although we're yeah. spread over countries and yeah. continents the boxing community is such a tight-knit group of people and you see there are some really friendly fun loving amazing people yeah um but I, I started to notice and see that when you make that mental decision your the, the ability to become more resilient and everything else can instantly improve because you're you're making mental mental notes uh this is going to be challenging this is not going to be easy. Do I want to do this? Well, yeah, if you can say that about boxing, maybe it could be about that job interview that you weren't going to do or that college program you didn't think you'd get to or that person that you thought you wanted to date and you were just yeah. afraid to step out on it. No, I started to see small little nuances in my life as I developed and dedicated myself to the craft of boxing. I started taking you know, a more responsible turn in everything else in my life, realizing if you want to get good at this, well, I might have to improve my sleep, so I might have to cut out some activities or improve some things or add some things or, uh, well, I'm not on weight, so I think I need to actually change my diet. So uh, not only resiliency, but um, discipline, dedication to the craft started to develop in all areas of my life from boxing, I would say. Man, that's awesome, man. Thanks for sharing that. That was awesome. It's one man. of the things, actually, Coach, you talk about have a goal, right? Mm -hmm. You need to have a goal when we go in to do this. And, mm -hmm. and I'll make a transition here to talk about someone else who had a goal that was very clearly defined in the boxing world who took one step closer to his goal mm -hmm. this weekend. So yesterday, of course, I'm referring to 135-pound unified champion Vasily Lomachenko who claimed the WBC belt 
from Luke Campbell. You gentlemen watched it? I did. I did. Great fight. Great fight, right? Really great fight, actually. Great fight. Yeah. I am. I think that the scorecards that were presented at the end were probably a little bit more distant than the, the competitiveness of the fight yeah, actually agree. reflected. The fight was more competitive than a 118 or 119 or whatever that case yeah, scorecard yeah. was, is my, is my personal opinion. What do you guys think? I, I can agree to that. Uh, I think Luke Campbell came in with a solid game plan. I yeah. think that he was resilient and not uh, backing down from the hype of yeah. the show that Vasily Lomachenko does put on. Um, he was good. he was good, and again, I think one of the bigger things people don't talk about is it was southpaw versus southpaw. So Vasily normally gets away with a lot of things. He did not have those super advantages, and Luke was a tough fighter. Uh, but yeah, I, I gotta agree, there was a couple more closer rounds. I think even again that first round that was, that was Campbell's round. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, it's, the thing that's interesting about this is Luke Campbell himself presented, and and I talked about this last week, that this fight was interesting, more interesting than, say, a Lomachenko versus a Krola, for instance. Mm -hmm. And the reason is is because there are clear advantages that Luke Campbell has going into the fight. Like, you look at him and you go, okay, well, he's also an experienced amateur, right? He has an, an Olympic gold medal from 2012, so he competed at the highest levels as an amateur as well and was successful. He won. He's also considerably taller. He's a larger man. He has a lengthy reach advantage. He's got all these things where you look at it. And the reason I called it interesting is because I said, if you went and you made the checklist, a lot of times when you go down, everything's in Loma's column. Yeah. You got the footwork, you got the speed, you got, you got everything, right. right? This is not that case. I think when you go and you look at Luke Campbell, he gets some check marks in that mm -hmm. column. It makes the fight more interesting. And I think it was reflected in the fight. You could see why it was more interesting. He he did struggle. Lomachenko struggled with the height, with the reach. Mm -hmm. It took him a while to yeah. find a way to get inside. Uh, he exposed himself to uppercuts. He was even hurt, in my opinion. I think it was in that seventh, seventh round, round. Yeah. Uh, where he did it. And so, personally, I'm surprised that people are so surprised. <laughs> That's kind of yeah. like, like, like you guys thought he was just going to walk yeah. through Luke Campbell. Most but I, people did. <laughs> But well, yeah. why? Like, I don't, I don't understand. It's the but, but here's the thing. I think, like, Loma has – he has, like, that it factor, man. Mm -hmm. We talked about before where – before at the weigh-ins, right? Luke Campbell holding the belt, and Loma instantly says, whoa, 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 whoa. Why does he he, he grabs the belt, and it's like – like, we talked – you were talking about the psychological aspect where Loma, you can't break him psychologically. Oh. That guy – and I don't know if it's just the way he was raised – and, and we talked about, I think it was the seventh round, where Luke was winning that round. And Loma knew, okay, I know I'm losing this round. I'm going to take it right back. Yeah. He has that, that factor that you can't teach, you can't coach. Mm -hmm. He just he's like a shark. And, and, and it starts with, with how he prepares. You know, he does a lot of mental things. Yes. But he has something that you can't teach. Like, it, it's crazy. Let me ask you guys. So as people who are professionals in the way of strength and conditioning and fitness – when you look at some of the obstacles or some of the things that Lomachenko puts himself through in training, which are unique. I mean, you, you can watch the guy literally hammer nails through a wall with his fist like he takes the nail and punches it through the wood. He's going underwater for four-plus oh, minutes right. at a time. Like he has a jumping into freezing cold water yep. and then jumping back out of it, right? Some very unique training methods, I would say, not something that is probably your standard strength right. and conditioning type activities. How do you guys receive activities like that? Like when you see it, do you look at it and go like, I, I can understand the value in that? Or is it more it's like, wow, about, that's like, yeah. like to me, it's the mental. It's th those exactly. are mental things, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, like how you talked about resilience, like him jumping into cold water. It's like, like it's, it's like you get knocked down, you know, with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Linadius, right? He gets knocked down and he's just like, right all up. right. Like there's no psychological break of like, man, I just got knocked down. No, it's like, mm -hmm. all right. Let me smile at you. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done harder things than this, right? And I think it starts with his dad, the way he was raised. He just, he doesn't, and, you know, his dad's, his, he keeps his emotions so even keel. Mm -hmm. you, you watch his dad, he's never up, never down. And it's just, there's something that you can't teach about some of those things that he does where, again, I, it's just, he has a psychological advantage over anyone he's going to fight. He's got it in check. I, I have yet to see him in his professional career break yeah. mentally yep. show he's fatigued or outclassed or yep. he's having too hard of a time figuring out his opponent's puzzle yep. so yeah the, the mental game is he's on another level and uh again like you said it, it it's one in a million chance every fighter is unique but there is 
something special and unique yeah. about this father-son duo that yep. n- we have not seen or not going to see replicated for some time because a lot of people don't know. Lomachenko's dad's got no boxing experience. Zero fights. Zero professional fights. Zero training. But he knows. And there's a lot of things that you can pick up on and then when you know that you know. Like taking your son out of boxing when he's a young child to get into dancing for two years, yep. which most people would criticize. Like, that's the worst thing you could do for a young boxer. Yep. In hindsight, now that he has two world champions, you go, you want your kids to dance too? Because that's what, what we're seeing. Um, yeah. I love Lamachenko. I think he's one of the best fighters in the world. Um, and people talk about the 12th or now 13 fights or whatever. He's got 400 plus amateur fights, man. He's got some experience. He's, his body's got some wear and tear now that you've seen with the, sur- with the surgeries and things. Yeah. But he's still one of the best. Yeah. It's interesting. That's actually an argument that I very recently watched Andre Ward and Timothy Bradley have on on the importance of those 400 amateur fights mm. uh, and how that should be reflected. And I can kind of see both sides of it because yeah. I think Andre Ward says, hey, yeah. you know, those 400 fights matter. So when you're fighting for a title in your second professional fight, what's the big deal? You already had 400 <laughs> fights. Uh, Timothy Bradley thinks differently. He thinks, right. no, professionals, it's different to fight as a pro. Although I would say there's some period in there where Lomachenko was actually competing, like in the, uh, like the, semi, the like well, in the in the the Aiba mm-hmm. World Boxing, you know, uh, I I forget what it's even the LA Matadors, like we have a team yeah. mm-hmm. that competes and they're effectively professional fighters. They're not wearing headgear. They're doing four rounds. They're getting paid. Uh, only it doesn't go on their professional record. Right. So so there is some of that transitionary state in there. But I think it's a little of both. I th- the point is, is when you face 400 opponents, and mm-hmm. I think this is the value of amateurs, because a lot of guys I see, they kind of want to come in, they want to go pro. Yeah. You know, like they, they come, I want to be a pro, mm-hmm. pro boxer. Um, but the challenge is, is what you don't get is the looks, man. The looks at all the mm-hmm. different opponents. Mm-hmm. Like when you've had 400 opponents, you've and you're seen you, You've seen people who are taller than you, who are faster than you, who are stronger than you, who are shorter than you. Like you've had to deal Right. in that 400 people yep. competing at an international level, yep. right? Competing at an international level. You had to deal with people who had advantages He's over you. some guys that have beat him in the amateurs and then never again, ever, 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 yeah. ever. And I love that. But see, now the, the, the brief point is you get a lot of experience and you can fight a whole diverse group of fighters, but mentally you check in and check out, check in and check out over and over again. There's, there's nothing that you could probably do to phase this guy. Yep. Like he yep. could break his arm. <laughs> be blind in one eye and then be losing yeah. four rounds and he and probably is going to still go out there yep. and perform pretty well and and that's one of the things that those rounds that the 400 amateur fights you get experience he's probably lost a round in those places and had to mentally prepare himself okay i'm yep. down on the cards i have literally two minutes left to finish this fight yep. what do i do yep. those are things that you can't get when you go pro immediately you you see a lot of fighters that are professionals now that have a limited amateur background and it, it can affect them professionally and it's, we see the, it. it's the whole delayed instant gratification right it's like people want to turn pro get paid but mm-hmm. his dad knew no the experience you know two gold medals like we'll get there the we'll, marshmallow we'll test there. the marshmallow test man yeah so it's like i did that on my daughter is that weird <laughs> well, what, did she eat it no uh, <laughs> nice 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 <laughs> for those of you who are wondering what we're talking about coach jerry recently posted about the marshmallow marshmallow test which is actually something uh, I came across I think from uh, Michio Kaku okay. uh, who, is, who is describing the marshmallow test it's a test of gratification to see if someone a uh, particular a young child will defer eating a marshmallow now in favor of getting two marshmallows later yep. like an hour from now yep. uh, and the belief is is that uh, the children who would defer uh, will understand uh, not succumbing to instant gratification. Mm, yeah, look it up. It's on YouTube, and <laughs> it's just. It, but it's like it applies to everything, right? It's like, are you willing to delay that 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 you know the 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 you turning pro and getting all the all the attention as an athlete? Are you willing to put in the the time training where nobody's watching? Right. I always mm. talk to my guys where I'm like, you know, you when it's fight night, you get all the attention. After you're getting all these pictures. Here's what they don't see. They don't see the, the moments that you're in here busting your tail, yeah. right? Nobody yeah. sees that. Like, nobody sees. They just see you fight night, hands up in the air, all this attention. And, you know, one of my f- the one thing I hate when people say is, like, you're lucky. It's like l- there's no luck involved, right? Luck nope. is that opportunity meets preparation, right? It's like all the stuff that, that boxers, and you talked about, like, more of the lifestyle where there's so much sacrifice, right? Michael's 21 years old. He's given up. 
his, some of his best years in life. He's never going to get 18 to 21 back. Right? I remember when I was 18, 20, I was going out, going to Vegas. Mm-hmm. He's never getting that time back for just the opportunity to possibly get a world title. Like, it's not even guaranteed. It's yeah. like he's willing to six years, five years, whatever it may be, just maybe the opportunity of, you know, making a living and so on. That to me is – that's why to me I take my job so serious because I'm like, I can't mess up. Yeah. Right? I, can't t- I can't be off on a training day. They get injured, you know, I'm taking a paycheck out of their pocket. It's like that's why I see a lot of a lot of coaches where they don't take it serious. They're not reading textbooks. They're not reading new research. It's like, guys, girls, like they're giving everything. You you can't afford to not get better if they're, you know, delaying some of their best times in their life, right? And and that's where it's like, are you willing to, to and that's with success and on, on all levels. Right? That's good. I'll say the level of discipline to be a professional fighter who competes uh, at an elite level is I, I don't know if I ever had it in yeah. me particularly at that age I yeah, think of myself right. at like 18 yeah. and go oh man could yeah. I have committed to getting yeah. up at 6 in the morning and yeah. running 5 miles or however many miles people are running in, doing the workouts going to school I don't know man you were a student athlete man you, I, you I had was. to do it I, you I, had to do it it's a different time set different <laughs> mindset as well and here's, here's another thing because I came from playing football which is a team sport so i'm i'm surrounded by 10 other Mm. individuals on this defensive lineup to accomplish a goal to stop this team so collectively i i have less of the responsibility and the burden when it comes to a combat sport and boxing you are in that ring by yourself yeah and that's something that a lot of people aren't willing to step into now yes and and we can say this you know outside of it we know a team it takes a village to raise a, a fighter yeah. you need a coach you need cut man you need somebody at home helping you yep. you know you're not going to ever do this completely on your own but when it comes to the the challenge and the test you're in there facing it on your own and uh, uh, more than anything it's a mental game that you have to overcome and a lot of people t- approach it differently i know a lot of fighters that can go into a fight fully on adrenaline and go i'm just going to kill this guy and get it over with a lot of people can go in with a strategy some people they just listen to what their coach says and nobody else. <laughs> yeah. There are a couple more fights we'll take a, a look at to break down. One of them that I'm really interested to discuss with you guys is actually Ramon Alvarez versus Ares Landy Lara for the WBC, excuse me, the WBA regular belt, not to be confused with the, the WBA super belt, which is the, the actual world championship for the WBA. Right. One there's, of the actual so world championships. Yes, there's many belts. Many belts. This is another topic that we could spend forever on. <laughs> is the number of belts. It's not going to the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the reason I want to talk about this one with you is because it, it involves the subject of weight cuts. Now, we talked about uh, nutrition earlier and you were saying there's right ways to cut weight, there's wrong ways to cut weight. And I have very recently on this show been asking or challenging the assertion that we should even allow uh, weight cuts from hydration so essentially allow me to lose water weight in order to make weight effectively what it allows is bigger men to compete in a smaller weight division okay the assumption is that you and i are both doing the same thing and so ultimately we're actually naturally a larger size and would be competing against each other anyway (laughs) at the bigger weight division but we're shedding a bunch of water weight so we compete at a lower weight division Ramon Alvarez is an example of someone who was an hour late to the weigh-in. Mm. He showed up, was still five pounds overweight. On fight night, he was 19 pounds above the 154-pound the uh, limit. He was completely drained, probably should not have been allowed to compete. You look at him when he's standing on the scale, his body is completely red from having taken salt baths for that hour, trying to shed the weight that he had no chance at shedding. And so I sit and I think, why? Like, why, why do we let fighters do it? Why don't we just make them compete in their weight class? Like, I, I, I don't understand anymore what the benefit is outside of people saying maybe, oh, it allows people to claim titles in more weight divisions than they would otherwise be able to do. Um, but is that really, like, the, the key? Like, why, why, why should we let people cut weight through hydration? So I think it starts with what we talked about earlier, tradition, right? Yeah. It's like <laughs> this is how it's always been done, right? Always. So it's like it's hard to – to challenge uh, something that's been going on because people are going to, again, confirmation bias, like, no, this is how we're, you know, you're going to start changing the sport. Then it, it could become a, a slippery slope. What's considered, you know, too much, right? Is mm-hmm. it five pounds, eight pounds? If you look at the research, 
eight to ten pounds is usually where they talk about in 24 hours you can rehydrate yourself, right? But that's not what's going on, yeah. right? We're going into the 12, 15, sometimes 40. even more than that percent-wise of what these athletes are, are cutting, right? I mean, uh, the the I don't know if you all have seen the video of Chris Cyborg yeah. on YouTube. Like, if you watch that video, have you seen it? No, I have not. So, so she's, thought, uh, she's as far in, as MMA goes, I'm not there. Yeah, she's <laughs> you got you got. So she's in the tub. I mean, it's like it gets you in your gut what she's going through. Like the whole team is in the she's in. She has these towels on the 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 the, the heater on. She is yelling. I mean, it's 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 so sad. This is right. like a day before a weigh in. Yeah. The day so of she's the trying to cut. She's trying to cut weight and she's screaming and it's like it hurts. Right. Yeah. So it's like. I think until and the sad part is like, you know, we've had deaths and still we haven't, you know, I know they're trying. I think the WBC, the IBF has the, the eight to 10 percent rehydration clause. Right. Like you can't yeah. come on. So I think they're hopefully implementing some some things. But as far as mandating it, it's like, yeah, you're it's going to be tough because you're taking a huge advantage. And at the end of the day, it's like that's that's why they do it. It's one, it's tradition and it's a huge I advantage guess. for those that, that can cut weight. It doesn't make it right, but that's kind of the why. By a huge advantage, what we mean is a larger man could fight a much smaller man, much but still smaller. but still do it on the scale. But that's not the intention of weight classes. Yeah. The whole point is that you're supposed to fight people who are your size. And, and I'm not saying, for instance, I, I want to clarify because someone, someone asked me about Manny Pacquiao. Uh, Manny Pacquiao is different. Manny Pacquiao is different because he's a small man who goes up in weight yeah. to fight people. He's not a big man who loses. Yeah. 50. Manny Pacquiao has to consume 30,000 <laughs> calories a day <laughs> to fight at 147 pounds, yeah, actually, right? That is true. So, so there's, a, there's a big difference between adding that weight or yeah. bulking up and saying, I'm going to dehydrate myself yeah. and not have fluid in my brain and not have, you know, not even be able to produce a urine sample yeah. because <laughs> I've lost so much water weight that I don't have anything in me to produce this sample. Yeah. And I, and I don't understand that end. I don't understand going down. I have no problem with Manny Pacquiao gaining weight. My problem is really with, because I think it can be done comfortably. Yeah. That's what it, yeah. It, can, yeah. it can be. Yeah. But, yeah. But I, I, most people aren't doing the safe scientific <laughs> approach yeah. to cutting yeah. weight. Two random notes. I got to say, Manny Pacquiao is super nice, and he does eat like that. I was at his house <laughs> a couple weeks ago, like right the week before the Keith Thurman fight. I was at his house. And he has to, man. Uh, a small dude. He's a super small dude, yeah. but super humble, great, <laughs> nice, very, very, very amazing senator. Um, but the other note to that was like one of my first fighters that I ever coached and cornered was this MMA fighter in New Jersey. And uh, when we talked and sat down, with his, you know, about the, the, the cut, he's like, yeah, coach, I'm going to cut from, you know, where I'm at now. I'm like, so you're 195. It's like, yeah, and we signed for 155. I'm like, oh, you know that's 40 pounds. That's crazy. Like, yeah, no, no problem. And I mean, lo and behold, this this guy was a professional at doing this from wrestling in his back. I was just say wrestling. He yeah. he did it. 40 pounds in a couple of di- week. Like not even. It was the most disturbing thing ever. You know, I was gracious and happy that he got the win. Um, against a guy that was supposed to be 155. And he, he was exceptionally larger. So he had a strength <laughs> advantage to a degree. But, you know, and I, that, was, that was early in my, in my coaching career. But now I have definitely have done a lot more research. I, I care about my fighters. And even more to that, I'm seeing, again, we just had a few deaths in the boxing world. Exactly. When you dehydrate, it does so much more on a, on, on a microscopic level that you might be dehydrating your brain, getting yourself more susceptible to injuries. Absolutely. And to yeah. uh, death. And that's yep. what's something that's not talked about. People are just cutting by saying, oh, I'm just going to cut my calories completely. I'm going to fast or I'm going to dehydrate and not have any water. Well, yep. well, yeah. we're, we all need water and <laughs> food. That's especially water. <laughs> Pretty much every <laughs> yeah. human being. On I've this actually earth. I've heard coaches say, "Hey, you know, at the end of the day, if you need to fight hungry, then fight hungry," kind of thing. Uh, and and yeah. even that, I think, isn't basically the most sound, uh, you know, thing yeah. to go through. Yeah. But when it comes to dehydration, I'm it's a hundred percent. Everything will tell you that you're dehydrating your brain. Mm-hmm. The protective layer of fluid around it is is less. You're more susceptible to concussion. You're more susceptible to traumatic brain injury. Yep. And I just don't understand why we need to do it. We have weight classes. Just fight people in your weight class or go up and fight people who are bigger than you. You know, I'm really excited to see a, a generation of fighters that do stay around the class that they are at. I mean, yeah. I remember it was a rumor maybe that Floyd kind of walks around close to his weight class. At he one, does. Was at 154. I was like, mm. 
why doesn't everybody else do this? Mm-hmm. We're all following every, every other fighter wants yeah. to do the shoulder roll and wants <laughs> to live the lifestyle that he does. Why yeah. can't you? Why can't we relatively stay healthy and yeah. stay in the shape that you're supposed to all year round? Yeah. Uh, in fact, for some of his catchweight fights and going up to one, he opted to just stay at his normal weight instead of instead of gaining weight because he felt like it would cost him speed. So there yeah. are fights mm-hmm. where he could have weighed in heavier but weighed in at 149. Because that's what he walks around at. He doesn't want it to cost him speed, right? And I think, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I've gradually, I haven't heard an argument yet that makes sense for why we should permit fighters to shed tremendous amounts of water weight in order to make weight classes that they aren't really justifi- justifiably supposed to be in to begin with. Yeah. Like, I, I, don't, I don't see it. I, I don't see I it. Can't, I, I can't. I mean, I'm trying to think in my head, like, what could we do? I mean. At the end of the day, we also again go back. It, it, boxing is an, it's an entertainment sport. Yep. We're doing this, sure. and the people are doing this as prize fighters. So, yep. to a to a you know target audience, they're they're entertaining the masses. Now that's a you know could we do less rounds? Could we change some things around to make it more uh, make fighters live longer and and you get more worth out of their lives? But I, it, it's hard. Less rounds is another one. This is actually, we recently on this show debated, there were four specific rule changes that we talked about. Coach, what's up? Hey, the coach you, is here. Dude, you came just in time. Hey. I want to get your opinion on this, too. <laughs> you guys, please up, welcome the owner of Sweet Science Gym, where we film Beat the Count podcast every hey. week. <laughs> Coach Hello. Marco Trejo. Hello. Is this working? Is this on? Yeah, I don't know. Can you hear me? <laughs> Is this on? <laughs> I, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you guys. I can hear you. All right. Sorry. You remember that. how this works, right? I, I don't know. It's kind of forgot. It's, <laughs> like take, it's like taking a vacation for a couple of weeks and coming back to work and be like, what do I do? What do I miss? What do I miss? <laughs> Is this thing on? It's on. Thanks, yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Sorry. I was at um, boxing fights. Uh, hey. and we thanks won. for having me. You're still a co-host. <laughs> <Just 'cause laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Just cause, just because you're at fights every weekend now, yeah. I think you still have co-host status on the show. <laughs> oh, thank you. I think you've been on <laughs> more shows much. than anybody else. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> but we were just talking about different boxing rules. The, the one that we were talking about right now is, did you see the Ramon Alvarez or uh, the highlights like, of it last night? Against uh, Edwards' kid, right? No, no, no. Oh, right, no. What yeah, against uh, Ayers Landy Lara for like, oh, the oh, WBA. Oh, that's right. That's right. Uh, no, I didn't watch that. What happened? Yeah, you didn't need to. But he... <laughs> he well, he was massively overweight. He tried to he tried to shed it as much as he could. Took the salt bath. Was an hour late to the weigh in, and was knocked out in the second round. But uh, we kind of brought the question up that we were talking about, which is: Is there a reason, a good reason, to allow fighters to shed water weight in order to make weight? Like, why don't people just compete in their weight class? Like, why do we let fighters shed twenty pounds of water weight? If you're Ramon Alvarez, why is that allowed? Um. You know, if boxing, everybody wants their advantage, you know, so that's yeah, that's what is, it is. What and and then it's, I don't know, I don't want to say that boxing's unfair, but, you know, it's, it can be unfair sometimes. So I think they're starting to address that by making limits on what you can gain after the fight or after the weigh-in and all that stuff. Yeah, but, that's big. but, yeah, I mean, it's it's dangerous. And then and then it makes for a poor performance, too, if you're uh, if you take it to that extreme, you know, so. Absolutely. And you mentioned the WBC does have different things. Like, for instance, they incorporated a 14-day mm-hmm. weigh-in, a 7-day weigh-in. They do a weigh-in after the fight. IBF. Uh, won't even allow you to compete for the title if you if you gain more than like ten percent of your contracted yeah. weight, yeah, something like that. So there are things I, I just feel like we could still do more. Like if Ramon yeah. Alvarez can come into a WBA title fight and be five pounds overweight, and then the next day be twenty pounds heavier than one fifty four, and so drained from trying to cut weight that then obviously we're not doing enough. That's kind of <laughs> that's kind of yeah. obviously that we, that we could do more if somebody can still go through that or whatever you guys were referring to with like cyborg and the bat like if somebody has to go through that then obviously they could do better too yeah agreed well they case. should just move up in weight class make it well, right I, like I that mean one. yeah of course <laughs> so, I mean I think Jerry mentioned that earlier or somebody mentioned yeah. that uh, why why go to that extreme if it's gonna affect your performance but uh, that's up to the sanctioning bodies to to dictate that you know and if if they don't if they don't set rules. You know, there's loopholes for a reason, mm-hmm. you know, th- to take advantage of them. So, Coach, do you think it will ever change? Um, yeah, I, th- I think so. I think so. There, But incrementally. Okay. And it, it has to, you know, and for fighter safety. And and we've seen recently that, that people have passed away in boxing, have, you know, have died. And, and maybe that has 
And I've heard that a lot of it has to do with the, the dehydration and not enough, you know, not enough, uh, I guess, water mm. for the brain, you know, yeah, and exactly. it's, and I mean, you're, you're taking damage to the brain anyways. And, and then if you, if you reduce what, what you have in your body, uh, and you're dehydrated, it's going to make it worse. So absolutely. You know, at the end of the day, it's an entertainment sport as much as we love it. It's not worth anybody dying for though. Yeah. So absolutely. they should definitely, uh, you know, add some, add some more rules. If they can add some rules without, uh, without diminishing the entertainment value, then I'm all for it. What do you think about this? PJ, you mentioned fighting shorter rounds. One of the things that you had said in that where you said, oh, dehydration, fighting shorter, or or maybe not shorter rounds, but shorter fights overall. So not necessarily reducing a round from three minutes, but the the total length of the contest. What if we were to say professional men's fights were were not 12 rounds, they were some other amount of rounds? Would it, if they were eight rounds or six rounds, would that take away from the entertainment value of the sport? Well, it depends on who we're watching. You know, there are some <laughs> fighters that we know uh, have been famous for letting a fight go out and then using that last round to just run in a circle. And we've had other fighters that have gone out in the first 18 seconds yep. with the mindset to destroy this person and decapitate them. Um, so every fighter is different. You know, each person is unique. Now, just to, to caveat about that, I think maybe not shortening the number of rounds. Maybe if the rounds were smaller – Maybe if we knew, if a fighter knew I only have two minutes or 90 seconds, maybe there might be more action. There might be more spurts of hard action. So that could be more entertaining. It also maybe might lead to more brain damage. Uh, so either or. Uh, I hard think to say. It's right? hard to say. Um, I, I think it's interesting, you know, because growing up watching boxing in the 60s, 70s, 80s, we had 15-round fights. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's not happening now. I wonder what But it's still entertaining. Right? Fights it's, are still entertaining. Fights are entertaining regardless, I, I think. And that's, that's why boxing is such an, it's such an interesting sport. You know, doesn't matter where you came from. doesn't matter what language you speak or where you were, you know, what your socioeconomic status is. You can love boxing. You yep. can see yep. the, the value in two human beings competing in, a, something, in something that you don't play. Yep. You know, they're not in there playing with each other. They are fighting. And it is entertainment. But I think at the end of the day, as long as these sanctioning bodies are going to have uh, the heart and the interest of their fighters, their uh, entertainers covered, it should develop and make the sport better overall, hopefully. So here, here's one thing that I see. Like if you went from 12 to 8, one big disadvantage is you're dis- you're, 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 uh, the guys and girls that have better conditioning, now you're taking away that advantage as well, right? right. So yeah. like the, you know, the athletes that – they have amazing conditioning like that's one big advantage that those athletes have maybe over other athletes that are not as well conditioned right so i think that that could be an issue too is now you're taking away four rounds that that athlete might wait a little longer before he does more damage and you know now now you're you're making a big disadvantage on those athletes as well that's yeah great. there's definitely concessions on either side because it's kind of like coach said on one end of the spectrum is like if we take it back to you know 600 bc to the olympics and we're watching men who are like hitting each other with metal on their fists and they're trying to kill each other. Like nobody wants to see that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's one one extreme. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. You'd, you'd be surprised. Yeah, you true. don't watch UFC, do you? I, yeah, no, I don't. Say. <laughs> but I and I think the other end of the spectrum is to say like, you know, well, boxing is dangerous. We know it's dangerous, so why do we let people box at all? So there's like, you know, medical professionals who would tell you uh we should put advisories out and not allow people to box. And then yeah. there's the other end of the spectrum which is, you know, gladiators, which so we can agree that the, the middle is somewhere in between. So we, it could potentially disadvantage well-conditioned athletes. But if it increases the overall safety of a fighter in, in a measurable way, yeah. then I think it's something that we would have to consider. So it's not necessarily that you know, we want to disadvantage everyone. I think it's kind of the opposite of that. You just want to make it like by saying, hey, weight cuts, for instance, that's about putting everybody on a level playing field. Right. Yeah, the way that true. weight cuts take place is unleveling. It, the way coach describes it, it's gaining an advantage. It's gaining right. an advantage over someone. It's making things unlevel. So it's not really about, for instance, if you're, and this is, I know I use this example a lot. If you're Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. and you're fighting Andy Lee, that's not really about who's better, who's a better boxer. It's about one man who's, you know, comes in and, and weighs, outweighs you by 25 pounds. And it doesn't matter that you're hitting him in the face because he's just a massively bigger man, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, it's kind of, don't you think? Like, I feel like it, 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 the weight cut in that sense is really just an advantage for someone. Yeah, well, Sergio Martinez versus Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. People thought the man that's 25 pounds heavier would have some advantage. Yeah. 
if if he could touch him within eleven and a half rounds in that last mm-hmm. round. We'll but go down in boxing history. I, I could assert that if Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. was actually a 160 pounder, that he wouldn't oh. have made it to the 12th round, hmm. because it, right, right. <laughs> so like because he's getting he's getting so beat over yeah, the course of the first 11 that they they might have had to stop that fight earlier because you know the only thing that's saving him is the fact that he's got a 180 pound chin. <laughs> yeah, so like, Jeez. so that's kind of kind of the difference there. That's a good one. It's fighting though, you know. It's 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 hard to make sense of a lot of it. Most of the time, you know, it's just it's fighting, which is it's a beautiful sport. But it's just, yeah, you take every advantage you can. And if the uh, WBC they'll or, let you. Yeah. And if they'll let you, you'll do it. You know, um, yeah. I think uh, I think the way in uh, the day of the fight would uh, would help that out. Mm. I think if people could weigh Amateur. in the day of the fight. Yeah, I, I you actually I hear people go back and forth on this. The day of the fight, because obviously that's how it used to be. It used to be that you yeah. weigh in the day of the fight. I right? didn't know that. I'd yeah. Really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> when? It used to be the way. Here, let's look at when they. <laughs> the 20s, I'll look at when 30s, they changed. 40s. It. My bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> that would be a game changer, you know. Coach, you were just coming from a tournament, right? Yeah. Um, it's called the, called the Blue and Gold. How'd you do? Uh, did great. I took one fighter, Joey Abuti. Hey. And he won. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, nice. yeah, buddy Abuti. He, uh, he won Friday. Dominated on Friday, and then the uh, second round knockout today, hey, and nice. he got most outstanding boxer of the tournament. So it's good. He did. He's he's coming along. That's it. And uh, I just I just got a message from somebody a few days ago that uh, he should be sparring Leo Santa Cruz in maybe about two weeks. Nice. Once Leo starts sparring in his camp, from his camp. So that's exciting for uh, a kid that I've trained from uh, from no fights, you know, from zero to where he's at now. And today was his thirtieth bout. He's uh, twenty three and seven right now. Nice. Let's give him one of these. Woo! <laughs> hey. <Yeah. laughs> nice. Bang, bang. Uh, yeah. I have I have a video I have a video where I did the uh Who I did, did that right now. <laughs> I did the I did the walk. You know the walk that he does? The walk? Oh, yeah. did you really? Yeah, it came out pretty good. <laughs> we'll practice. With the robe and everything? No robe, just the walk. No robe, just the walk. <laughs> That's funny. Oh man. Congratulations to Joey Abuti. He was a former guest on Beat the Count. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, I know. Yeah, he's, buddy. Getting, he's getting good. Uh, October, we're going to uh, Olympic trials in Ohio. Hopefully, we get first or second place. Um, if not, then we'll continue to fight. There's an Olympic trials in November. And depending on how everything goes, I got I just got an uh, invitation from the uh, Israeli Boxing Federation for him to train with the team over there in, like, January and February. Wow, so from, major from awesome. the Israeli Boxing Federation. Yeah, I've been talking to them about Joe. His, oh, uh, okay. Yeah, his dad is uh, was born in Israel, so you know, trying to uh, get in where we fit in, I guess. Yeah, you know, like wherever it. we can. You know, so it's it it's all good growth opportunity. Yeah, I mean, for good him experience. to fight international, any international experience is good. I was actually saying that earlier to Jerry. There's, yeah. there's like you know, you hear we've had a lot of people on the show who are like. Uh, champions of different varieties and there's youth champions Mm -hmm. uh, you know different things like that but realistically kind of what separates you is you know you're fighting international competition is one of the big things if you're fighting people internationally Mm -hmm. it's a completely different level than just fighting people here yeah I think so because uh, from what I've seen I've gone to one international tournament and there's such a variety of styles from different regions and countries where you think you know this is just boxing I think uh, just boxing, just boxing, right? Or so this is just boxing, but there's um, there's so many different styles, and you know when you learn so much in like thirty, forty, fifty, sixty fights in the United States, but now you're going to fight some another guy that has sixty, seventy, eighty fights, and he's from another country, different style of boxing. Yeah. It just uh, it jumps your boxing IQ like so many points, mm-hmm. you know. So and not and it's a select few who get that international experience, so. Exactly. So. Exactly. So I agree with you for once on yeah. something. <laughs> and open division. That was the other thing. <laughs> that am- I, I was also saying that a lot of times people may be a youth amateur champion, but that's not the same. A national amateur champion yeah. as a youth versus a national amateur champion in like the open division. Yeah. There's a big difference between that. Yeah. There was a big controversy this weekend on this, this blue and gold thing. There was a kid with uh, 100, 120 fights and he fought against a kid that had about 15 fights. Is that and all? Yeah, oh. <laughs> and it was uh, you know it was a, a bit of the kid with fifteen fights was tough. He held his own. I would say he's tough, but it was a a dominant and lopsided victory. Oh. And the kid got a, a little bit hurt, 
maybe a little bit more hurt than he should have. It could have been stopped early. But as I told the the people for the guy with the 15 fights, I told them, you know, uh, you can fight anybody. Once you're open class, you're open. So you you got to make sure you have that experience before you go in there, you know, because right. you, you could have 20 fights and you could be fighting someone mm-hmm. with 120. And that's not to say, because I've taken those risks with a fighter that had 15 fights and he fought a guy 75 fights and we beat him. And I've done that also where we got our ass kicked, mm-hmm. you know. So it's got it, – it's just case by case, I think, with the fighter. And, and that's real. you got to know if he can take it or not, you know. PJ, how many how many fights did you have as an amateur? <sighs> A little under 20. I think I had 18. 18 fights? Something like that. Did you ever consider going pro? I thought about it. Uh, still dabble with it here and there. But my passion has been to help people and to coach them um, and to transfer the skills and the knowledge that I have been acquiring from other coaches and to help them. Um, yeah, the competitive bug's no longer in my ear, in my mind. I am more focused on helping others. You know, ego aside, I got everything I need, man. Uh, I'm married. Awesome. I got a but he can box, though. I've seen him. In, uh, he can box. I've seen him in there with pros and, and some really good people. So he can box. I can hold my own. Yeah, oh, yeah, he can box. In terms of helping people, one of the things I saw actually on your YouTube channel is that you actually brought some uh, people from Wasp Projects here, uh, children, uh-huh. to train, right? Yeah. Uh, is that something that you do? Uh, like you, you've done that before. Is that part Pretty of a program? Regularly. Yeah, uh, Watts. I've been involved with uh, Red Eye Inc. for about five years now. Since I came to LA, um, they're a nonprofit uh, focused a lot into the Watts community and Imperial Courts. Um, and yeah, Justin Mayo, really good guy, good God fearing man. It just loves people. Gives himself to helping the communities here in Los Angeles and. Um, I got invited to Watts one day, you know, back in 2015, and it's just there's a community center in the middle of the projects uh, around a place where there is need. Uh, formerly a hugely gang and, and drug infested area uh, where Red Eye came in and they bring volunteers and people come and impact the community there, uh, spending time mentoring young kids, helping them out with outreach programs. Uh, Watts does a lot of other things in the city with uh, Skid Row, helping out with the homeless community. Uh, They do things with the elderly communities uh, going out to homes. Um, But I was involved with Red Eye and I just saw a lot of kids, you know, uh, especially coming from Philadelphia. I I lived out in the streets, so it resonated with me very much. But uh, in this area, in the middle of, of Watts, these kids that are so full of joy and full of hope uh, didn't have much around them, didn't have much people speaking life into them, encouraging them, helping them try to find finding a way out of the hood, knowing that there is more than just selling drugs or playing basketball or rapping. And uh, ever since I started to just show up on Saturdays, it was one of the things that has been a staple in my life. Uh, so, yeah, I, I train a lot of the kids down there, mentor them, uh, train them here at Sweet Science, go out to there. Uh, sometimes I even take some of the kids to some of my favorite training facilities out here, like the Manhattan Beach Sand Dunes. And um, my big thing is just reinvesting back our time and our knowledge back into the communities and to the people that are less fortunate than us. That's awesome, man. That's and awesome, I, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that um, that there are other time commitments and stuff like that. And I also want to make sure that I give everyone an opportunity to sort of tell us what they've got going on, where we can follow them, what we should be looking at. Uh, PJ, I'll start with you. I know you got all kinds of different ways that we could we could follow and see PJ. So let's yeah, what's up, buddy? Uh, man, <laughs> well, first of all, man, I'm on social media, so you guys can follow me uh, on Instagram at Train with PJ. Uh, I'm also on YouTube. Uh, I'm on my my own YouTube, but I'm also on the Fight Tips channel as well with Shane Faison. Um, and then also, if you wanted to train with me, I'm on a app called Fight Camp, uh, which is an at-home boxing fitness experience in which you can actually train and take classes with me in the comforts of your own living room. Uh, so you can find me on social media. You can train with me at home, or you are more than welcome to come here to Sweet Science and train with me here in L.A. Nice. Jerry, what's up? Where can we follow you at? Uh, so you can go Instagram, probably the best, coach underscore Jerry underscore. Um, I got two podcasts that I'm working on. So one is more just on YouTube. You can go on YouTube and um, it's all about conditioning. So it's everything as far as research, how you can apply it. It's just specifically discussing boxing, but other sports as well. So if you want to learn about conditioning, some research and, and some application, then go on there. And then I'm almost about to release my my personal development podcast. So it's the it's the next uh, next level mindset podcast. 
talking a lot about just growth mindset, uh, sh- bringing on some guests about like, I would love to have him have you come on down and just, you know, everyone has a story to tell. I'd love to be on there too. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just no, but, I'm but, but it's, it's, it's just, you know, getting people to share their stories and it's just more of an uplifting and, and you know, people can relate to, to the struggle and trying to find some people to, to inspire. And, and yeah, so that should be out pretty soon. Awesome. Coach, what do you think? Uh, not too much. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> what do I think about what? Where you can find me? Yeah, where should we follow you at, man? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, SweetScienceGym.com. <laughs> Do people even you use dot com? Instagram. Do people even use dot coms Man. anymore? <laughs> yeah, I, I, next time we'll rehearse this part. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, I have a. It's on our Instagram is Sweet Science Gym also. Hey. Uh, Sweet Science Gym and then website SweetScienceGym dot com. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just come down to our place in Hawthorne and uh, come train with us. You know, we got uh, we got good fighters, great trainers, um, excellent uh, energy in here, good positive attitude. So just come on down, and join the team. Coach doesn't crack the whip too hard. <laughs> you know what I mean. You're all right. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> I mean, just you know what? It just depends on how much you need, you need that whip cracked on you. Because I mean, right. so, some people <laughs> good like, answer. Like good uh, answer. Like answer. like, like yeah. you know, I could have the most talented fighter, but if he's lazy, then you know you gotta put your foot in his butt. There you go. But awesome. uh, like Joey Booty to talk about, man, that kid <laughs> trains so so damn hard. <laughs> you know, everybody in here knows how hard that kid trains, and yeah. and his um his work ethic ha- is so far past his talent that has just carried him and yes. now his talent's starting to catch up with with his work ethic but you know if you want i guess whatever you want to do in life you got to work hard for it you know and if you got the talent it's going to help you but you got to have that work behind it so there it is yep. yep well said well said so i'm going to give a shout out to combat sports collective this episode is brought to you by combat sports collective What don't they do for fighters? They do photography, videography. They offer apparel, branding, and products like the water that you see here, CBD oils, and more coming. Follow Combat Sports Collective on Instagram. And, of course, follow me on Instagram at BeatTheCount and on Facebook at BeatTheCount. I'm not cool enough to have a Twitter (laughs) yet. You guys have a Twitter? I do. Yeah, Yeah, I knew it. You guys all have Twitter, right? No. Oh, you don't? No. Okay, we're in the same boat. It's too much work. (laughs) (laughs) Instagram is enough. (laughs) Oh, man. Oh, you know what? At the end of that promo, I'm supposed to do this. Bang, bang. bang. There we go. (laughs) What was that? That's Michael Dutchover saying bang, bang. (laughs) That's funny. It's one one of the few sound effects that I've I've incorpororated into the show. I got to play with that after... Dude, I I need your. I only have three, so I've got like fifteen slots on here. Oh my! You got to recommend some more. Oh yeah, there's. I there. must break you by Drago. Yeah. You know shit about boxing. <laughs> yeah. You got to have that one. I said one. that one last week. You need to do that one. You got to yeah. do the Roger <laughs> Yeah, you do the Roger And the, and then uh, you got to have Larry Merchant. Like if I was fifty years younger, I'd <laughs> whip your <laughs> ass. Yeah, you got to have that one. You'll help me out with this though. Oh yeah. Awesome. Oh yeah. This is our homework project right here. <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys. I know that it is a holiday weekend, and I'm sure you have. Much more important things to do, but I appreciate your coming down and sharing all of your knowledge and insight with us. Coach PJ, Coach Jerry, thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated, right. brother. I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>